What is up, everybody? I am Charlie Marlowe. That is the great Brendan Schaefer. This Careful. is Low Hanging Fruit. I think it's episode 12. We'll check on that. Brendan, how are you doing, buddy? How the heck are you? I feel good. I feel good. Glad to be with you this week. You didn't duck me. You didn't cancel on me. We're doing the podcast, man. That It's a great week to be alive if, if we're doing a podcast with Charlie Marlowe. First of all, we should never always start like this, but I never duck you. Hey, I'm traveling. Look, I was at the Cleveland Guardians. I heard. Home opener. Watching the Eclipse. They had the Eclipse. The yep. Eclipse was there. It was totality for four minutes. It was a good time. So I got back, what, two nights ago? I got to watch and listen on the radio was fun to the Sonny Gray game. So I was locked into the last two of the Phillies games against the Cardinals. So basically, let's let's start there. We'll do it again. We'll we'll work backwards. Phillies series, a lot to get to, as Martin Kilcoin likes to say. I love that Brennan line. Schaefer. Too. Yeah. So the fight in Phils, what did you think? Give us your take on that uh, three game set. I think that the Cardinals could have swept this series. It wouldn't have taken much for them to have done so. You have the uh, the overtime game on Monday. They get the point against Philadelphia, which is good. Um, with playoffs coming up, no, that's, a, that's more of a blues take. Uh, they, they go into extra innings and couldn't quite get it done. And then on Wednesday, you have a pretty solid pitching performance. I know everybody's beaten up Palante. I think what people should probably remember is that at the end of the season, when you look at every single MLB team, and you, you sort their bullpen ERA, nobody's going to have a zero ERA. So sometimes relievers are going to give up runs too. And yesterday, the relievers gave up a couple of runs. And so the Cardinals lose that game by one. But I notice a trend, Charlie. They keep scoring three runs, and that's not mm -hmm. enough runs to win games. So it's not that they're playing terribly. And we'll talk about Victor Scott and sort of the, the, the rotten day that he had on Wednesday. But offensively is still kind of the the drumbeat that I want to pound today because I feel like this team was built to score runs and just have a solid enough pitching staff to support those runs. And they're doing it on the pitching side. They're not really doing it consistently enough on the hitting side. And that to me is the story right now for the Cardinals, especially when you talk about the, the big guys, Nolan Arenado, Paul Goldschmidt, those numbers, you figure they're going to, they're going to come back to earth a little bit, come back to the median that we expect from those guys. But uh, when it hasn't happened so far, I think that's why you're looking at six and seven as we uh, talk here on the off day. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that yesterday's game was was probably the first game or the game where it was really impactful, where the Cardinals beat themselves in that game. And look, in terms of weather and all that, I, I was going to go to the game actually with my son, take him to his first game ever. When I looked at the forecast, plus yeah. I was coming back in town I had a lot of work to catch up. I'm like, looking at that forecast, it, it looked like the type of game where not fun to play in. You're kind of always just wet and uncomfortable. You saw Lance Lynn with the belt buckle. You're out there. I mean, he's got his glove on his head. It's constantly raining. There was nobody in the in the stands. So that that first ball, you know, I understand to, to Victor Scott, you know, that's got to be an error. I think he catches that ball in better weather conditions. That started everything off on a negative, on a negative uh, side of things for the Cardinals, and they weren't able to to catch back up. There, there were more mistakes. Really, really bad game, obviously for Victor Scott. And if you want to kind of start start there, it happens. He's a rookie, first time in the big leagues. Um, but this was a game the Cardinals probably should have won. And and you said they they could have swept the series. Definitely could have swept the series. You can certainly make the argument they should have won the series. Yesterday was really the game they gave away, and it was a rough one for uh, Victor Scott the second. It was a weird game because at no point watching that game did I feel like the Cardinals were going to win it, but you can look back at all those individual moments and say they had it right there for the taking. And yeah, Victor's error cost you in the first inning. Lance Lynn gives up a couple of unearned runs. Lance Lynn has this thing going, and this I can remember from 10 years ago when he was with the Cardinals. He, he wastes a good number of pitches. He had the four walks yesterday. And so he only gets through five innings on 95 pitches. I think he threw 52 strikes. I When he's attacking the zone and has his stuff working, he's he's really tough to beat. Yesterday, by kind of throwing too many pitches out of the zone, he beat himself a little bit, but still pitched really well. Like, he didn't give up any earned runs. There's no argument to be had there. You would have maybe liked yesterday to have been a day where he gets through six just because of the way the Cardinals had to use their bullpen Monday with extra innings, and then Tuesday – you know, backing up Sonny Gray, it's going to be a bit of a chore because he was on a pitch count. So that might, if they would have maybe gotten one more inning, maybe you don't go to Palante. Maybe, you know, things could have gone a little bit differently. 
but still pitched well, right? I think on the Victor Scott front, it's the error, it's the, the base running gaffe that happens in the eighth inning when then the Cardinals do have a rally. You get an RBI hit from Arenado, which has been a bit of a rarity, and that would have probably been an additional run if that bottom of the eighth plays out the same way and Victor Scott is on base instead of in the dugout after making the, the faux pas on the left turn. So I felt like yesterday was really the first day, and we can get into it a little bit more with the news reported by Katie Wu that Lars Nupar is expected to join the team on Friday in Arizona, but it's catcher Pedro Pajas that is expected to be the corresponding move going down, not Victor Scott. A lot of Cardinals fans look at that batting average for him, sub 100, and then you add in a day like yesterday where the two things that he's supposed to be solid at, which is fielding and base running, go against him. And then it was kind of a popular, well, see, we told you he needs to be sent down. I almost think that sends the wrong message of, look, if you're going to send him down at some point, I understand the the offensive numbers are what they are, but I'd almost like, and it sounds like the Cardinals are going to sort of stand behind him for the time being and say, look, you had a bad game. Those are going to happen. And we still believe in your skill set and your ability to kind of overcome that. But it was costly for the Cardinals yesterday. The offense continuing to not go was costly for the Cardinals yesterday. And it, yes, a series that they absolutely should have won because you certainly got the pitching, I think in all three games to be able to win two of three and to just come up short and, and now you're on the, the wrong side of a, of a 500 record is, you know, it's got Cardinals fans feeling some kind of way because they remember last April when things didn't go too well and, and people want to see a winning record and, and off to a good start on the season so that we don't have to even think about maybe this season going sideways on them too. Yeah, with Victor Scott, I saw you got a nice little debate with our guy Kyle Reese on, on Twitter about kind of his development. Yeah. And I, I understand it's easy to have the big reaction like we all do after yesterday because it was so glaring that it was a bad game for him yeah. all the way around defensively base running. You mentioned, I mean, slash line, he's batting 91 Oh, 91 on base, a buck 63 slugging 136 for a 299 OPS. We all know that that can't continue. Now, when you're talking about development, he is getting a lot of playing time. Now, after a while, I mean, you can't have a guy for a month straight batting 091. Right. The fact that he's out there playing and learning, I like. I I understand both sides of the argument. My thing with Victor Scott, if you were to send him down after yesterday, it's not just yesterday. It's more big picture offense. And I always say with these guys, if if you can't handle the adversity of being sent down after two weeks in the big leagues, when you are hitting .091, I don't know, and I'm, I'm not saying this specific to Victor Scott, but I don't know if you have the mental toughness to ever make it in the big leagues if you if you can't overcome a rough two-week stretch is what I'm saying. Yeah, and I think that would extend to a rough month, right? Like, I, I understand that you don't want a guy hitting 091 for a month. The Cardinals might end up having that because I think Victor Scott, at least according to Katie's reporting, which we trust, is going to be on that. He's on that plane. That he's in Arizona. He's going to be in the lineup. Uh, for at least a couple of the games this weekend, you would think, and going to continue to play center field. I would think that happens unless it just becomes untenable where it's clear that, okay, this is getting to him a little bit. He's now making errors in the field more frequently. Like one error, like Ollie Marmel said yesterday, it's his first error. He's going to make more of them. That's just baseball. That's the way it goes. And I think the Cardinals had the right approach to that. I think it just sends a little bit, like if your take, and, and this was Kyle's take, and, I understood it the whole way through. He didn't think Victor Scott was somebody that should be brought up in the first place. The Cardinals did it a little bit out of necessity. I said, let's go ahead and see. Put, you know, put put his feet to the fire and see how he comes out of it. Maybe he ends up looking great. Offensively, there are definitely strides that need to be made, but I've also made the argument that other guys in the lineup haven't looked great offensively either, guys who have been in the league for a decade. So it's not exclusive to Victor and to beat up on Victor alone of, well, he's not hitting. Yeah, he's hitting worse than those other guys, which I understand. But that's still something that, you know, the entire lineup is working through. My thought would be what he's provided center field defense yesterday notwithstanding is what the Cardinals wanted. It's why they brought him up. It's why they committed to Tommy Edmond in center field before the injury. So I think if you were to now, as a result of only yesterday, say we have to abandon ship, Lars Newpar is going to be the center fielder, and we're going to play Burley in left and Jordan Walker in right, and who cares about outfield defense? and having the best alignment out there, I think that would be a mistake. Now, if the Cardinals internally, we find, you know, let's say an alternate universe, it was Victor that's going down for the new par return, and they tell us, yeah, this has been in the works. We we kind of knew before even Wednesday's game that this was going to be the plan. 
then that's one thing. I just thought if you're going to do it, reactionary to yesterday is probably not the way to send him back. And so now, you know, let him play through that a little bit. If it doesn't go well and we're a couple weeks long and you can see around the horizon that Tommy Edmond is coming back, maybe then you say, all right, now we'll start this. We're going to have him go to go to Memphis and get some seasoning. Maybe Michael Ciani plays some center field, uh, giving him a look and giving him an opportunity. He's looked good defensively as well, so maybe there's not that big of a of a drop off. My whole thing is I don't think the Cardinals have to keep Victor Scott up for the whole year at this point. At first, I was watching the defensive plays and saying, "Hey, if this is a defense you're getting, that's the guy that I want behind this pitching staff." But even I would say on Monday and Tuesday in the Philly series, there were some routes that he took where you could just tell maybe a little bit of discomfort. He was he was making up for it with his speed and athleticism. But if even that part of his game at times looks a little bit spotty, I would say, yeah, there's going to come a time where you do send him down more likely than not unless the turnaround comes. But I would like to just see what he's made of a, a little bit this weekend and even in the next couple of weeks and say, maybe he has some adversity and how does he respond to that? That's what the Cardinals always like to talk about with young players. So I actually think I'm cool with them keeping him up particularly after what happened Wednesday. I made the case that if Wednesday was a normal 0 for 3 and he doesn't make any errors, I'm almost a little more understanding of maybe you go ahead and, and make that move if you want. I think it kind of sends the wrong message to do it now, though, and if development and psyche and those things are something that, that people do have concerns about, I agree with you. If you can't handle two weeks and it affects you for the next decade, wrong line of business. That's not Victor Scott. That's just generally speaking. I think now, though, you go ahead and let him play this out and see if he can respond to what happened on Wednesday. And I like that it seems like the Cardinals are going to give him that chance. Yeah, I guess what I would say is it's not just the bad game. It's the offense, it's the bad game, but it's also the pending transaction. You know, I, I would hope the Cardinals, whatever their line of thinking was in terms of Newt Bar coming back, who we're going to send down, I would hope they would just of stuck with that, regardless of what happened in one game. Agree. You know, like, I don't think it was a, hey, we're going to send down Victor Scott when new comes up. Oh, n now he had a really bad game. We can't send him down no. because it's going to mess up his psyche. I they don't think that's gonna, the case. They weren't going to send him down though. They, right. they, they don't that's want, Lars, they don't want Lars new playing center field, right? Like yeah. they would, la they want him in left because they believe having somebody like Edmund or Victor, or even if it ends up being Siani for a bit, that that is more valuable to the team because they have a pitch to contact staff. Miles Michaelis is going to have a better year if you have somebody with great range and center who's elite, comfortable at the position. Lars Newpark could be fine. He could be serviceable. But then you're also having a downgrade in left field because you're playing more Burleson there. Maybe you're playing more Donovan there and he can handle it, but he's more of an infielder who can is just so athletic he can play outfield. I think the best case scenario is Newpark stationed in a corner outfield spot and then everybody else around him, I think, is better for that because it allows them to prioritize defense in the outfield. So I agree. I don't think they were ever going to send Victor Scott down after uh, for Lars Newpar because they, frankly, they play different positions in the way the Cardinals wanted to play out. Wednesday didn't change that. And for me, that I know that long run, it's not sustainable to hit 091. I'm glad that Wednesday didn't cause a jerk reaction by the Cardinals to say, oh, suddenly this is untenable because what kind of message would that send? Yes, two weeks, you should be able to overcome that. But if it's, dude, you were so terrible in one game, you're not allowed to make mistakes or you're gone, that I think could linger with a player the next time he does come up. I think the Cardinals are handling this well, and it's not easy to do because it, you got a guy hitting 100 in your lineup. There are definitely some uncomfortable feelings about that, and rightfully so. And there's a lot of guys who are struggling. Maybe not to the level of Victor Scott, but overall... You know, and they're the not Cardinals, that ninth either. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah, and they're not getting paid... Well, those guys are getting paid, you know, yeah. 20, $25 million plus, whatever it is. So Cardinals are 23rd in baseball right now in uh, OPS with a 642. We're 13 games into the season. I'm not a person. I'm not going to make any big, big uh, conclusions. I mean, even even a month in, but but certainly not a couple of weeks. But there are some some trends that you don't love. And uh, Clearly, when you're talking about Goldie and Arenado, and those are your your big money guys, your cornerstone guys, both off to slow starts. But I'll tell you what, you know, Victor Scott is a different conversation for me because to me, he was only on the team to start because of injuries. So, right. you know, we're talking about this, but really because there were so many injuries and Edmund and Newpart, that's that's the reason he's up. I'm sure for development, the Cardinals would have loved to start him in AAA and let him, you know, get his feet underneath them and, and 
produce well there and see what happens later. So I'll throw it to you and just wondering, you know, who, who you're most concerned about. You know, Jordan Walker is the other guy that you're looking at. And, uh, you know, it's a buck 62, it's 238 OBP, it's 243 uh, slug, you know, his OPS is 481. This is a guy who has expectations, unlike Victor Scott. This is a potential cornerstone guy. He's off to a really, really rough start, and he had a really bad spring also. I would say that Walker is more concerning to me than, and yeah, you're right about Victor Scott. Some would make the case that, look, don't hamper a guy's development if it's just a necessity from injury thing, maybe you should have gone out and added a veteran, added a, a defense first bat or, or outfielder, or let Siani do it. Um, I was okay with them bringing up Victor, so I'm not going to go retrospective and make that claim, but I do agree with what you're saying. Victor's on the team because of the injuries that happened, and they rewarded him for the spring that he had. As far as the guys that are a little more prominent in the lineup, Walker is a concern because I think you're seeing some of what you saw when he was struggling at times last year with just hitting a bunch of ground balls and not making the most of his power. I think he had a, a, a track record in 2023, where if you look at the end of the year for a season that was, those numbers were compiled at age 20 and 21, pretty good numbers. So I think you, you can have faith that he can come out of this, but as a young player, it's, it is a little bit tricky because there's not as lengthy of a track record as there is for guys like Goldie in Arenado. What concerns me about Goldie is just, you know, the, the bunch of strikeouts, not a lot of power, but also I can think back to other years and remember that he does tend to start slow. So I, I would say of the three, I'm least concerned about Goldie. My concern with Arnado, he's got a hitting streak. It's like a nine or 10 game hitting streak. So it's not that he's not hitting. It's that he's not hitting the ball hard. He's not hitting for power. He hasn't homered since August 19th of last year. And I saw a stat today where if you look at his last four or five seasons and how many barrels how many times he barrels the ball in a given year? It's always between like 34 and 40, 41. This year, he's got zero. He hasn't barreled the ball once. I know that we're only 13 games in, but they'll play a series this weekend in Arizona, and then they will be a tenth of the way through the season. Arizona is maybe a spot where he's going to get one. I think Arnado is going to find a homer this, this weekend. I say that because he almost has to. This It's a hard thing to ask for home runs and say, yeah, guys need to be hitting homers. I couldn't go out and hit a homer, so it feels a little bit like, Hey, guy's got a hitting streak. Why should I complain about him not hitting home runs? But the way this lineup is built, he needs to hit homers. Goldie needs to hit homers. So I'm I'm concerned about Walker because of hitting the ball into the ground. I'm concerned about Arenado because it's not that he's not hitting, but he's not hitting for any power. And that's a, a trend you can trace back to the middle of August last year. So for me, I would rank it that way. Where Arenado a little more concerning than Goldie, but it's not like you can't pretend that Goldie hasn't been struggling as well. Yeah, so look, early on, the catchers, you know, Wilson Contreras, Ooh. OPS pushing 900. Ivan Herrera, arguably the most impressive guy that we've seen just because we didn't see a ton of him in previous years. And man, every everything about this guy, you got to like right now. Brendan Donovan off to a really nice start. You know, Gorman, I think, I think we'd both agree. I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, Nolan Gorman's never going to hit 300. Nolan Gorman may never even hit. 270. I don't know, but, right. but he's bringing the slug to the table. He's hitting home runs. I, I think for Mason win, you got to be pretty, pretty dang happy offensively because that was a big question mark as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not big picture worried about Arenado or Goldschmidt being bad. I don't think they're going to be bad. I, I think even in their worst year, they're going to be league average. And I understand, well, Cardinal fans, that's unacceptable. These guys are making 25, 30, 35 million dollars to make the playoffs. They can't be average. And I, I think that's fair to say. If if Goldie and Arenado are just an OPS plus of 104, yeah. I don't think I don't think that's cutting it. And I, and look, this is coming from somebody who on paper, I really liked this Cardinals offense entering the year. And I still do. I'm not going to overreact to two weeks, but those guys aren't young. Also, Arenado's Arenado swing looks different to me. You know, Goldie's is interesting. Consistent. Yeah. Gold, his finish. I'm saying Arnado's finish looks odd. Um, Goldie, it's so funny because his at bats were so good opening day. I mean, you're facing glass. Now you're like, Oh, we're all stupid. He had a terrible spring. I'm um, back to Goldie. Yeah. And then boom, it's, it's been back to kind of the spring training Goldie, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and the thing with Arnado's swing is like, I'm no hitting coach and I know everybody on social media likes to kind of nitpick at that. It does look weird and a little bit different and not consistent. And you're seeing that trend of 
the half swing where it's like that's almost pitch recognition to me of which pitch do I want to attack and swing at versus, you know, no one in time to be able to do something with that pitch or lay off the pitches that aren't ultimately going to be suitable to swing at. So I think he's kind of going through and feeling his way through that a little bit right now. Uh, agree with Goldschmidt as well, having that situation happening for him, maybe to a different different degree. But I agree with you. You can't have these guys even be just slightly above league average. And like you said, 104 OPS plus isn't going to cut it. You could go down the list on their rotation and say Sonny Gray is going to have a 279 ERA like he did last year. Miles Michaelis in front of a better or behind a better defense, he's going to end up with a 3.6 ERA because it's going to go better for him, the pitch to contact style that he has. Lance Lynn's got a 2.6 ERA right now. Let's say he goes three and a half. Everybody would be thrilled with that, I think, if Lynn gave you that. Matt's is probably going to throw 140 innings, 150, not be a workhorse, but he's had some good stuff. Let's say he stays healthy and you go another. It's a three and a half ERA. Holy smokes, you got four guys, and Kyle Gibson's going to be kind of your number five with maybe a four and a half ERA. I think Cardinals fans would go, wow, what a rotation. That's better than I could have envisioned. We'll take it. And let's say your bullpen ranks 10th in ERA in the league. Wow, the bullpen's even. If those two have an OPS plus of 104, they're not making the playoffs. You could do all those things, and they could still not be the team they need to be. I think that's how important those two guys are in the middle of the order. Unless everybody else is just hitting above their head, I don't think the Cardinals, designed the way they're designed, can do it without Goldie and Arenado. And that's, I agree that it's not that they're going to hit a 570 OPS like they have now. I don't think that'll be the number at the end of the year. But if it's 732 for the OPS, I still don't think that's going to be enough for the Cardinals. Okay, so bright spot. Yesterday, you know, Lance Lynn was was very good as we talked about. But uh, I just think, and and Kittridge is somebody who's really impressed me. But he also, yep. he has that big league pedigree where I wasn't really worried. I know coming off an injury a little bit, but that's a, that's a proven big league, really good reliever. But uh, Zach Thompson, what he gave you yesterday, you know, three and a third, Gave up four hits, but six strikeouts. And uh, we'll see what happens with his role. You know, he's not going to be able to throw three-plus innings. You're going to have to figure out, you know, his rest. You know, can he go multiple innings, take two days off, whatever it is. But uh, I just think in the modern game of baseball, you know, it gets back to what we brought up in the first series against the Dodgers with the Ryan Yarbrough. I think having that length guy who really can come in there and every once in a while go three innings but go an inning in two thirds. If, if Zach Thompson can be anything like he was yesterday, I think that's a really nice piece for the Cardinals bullpen. And also just because I'm thinking about him as the person, God, if I'm him, if I get sent down again, because, Hey, we got to keep you stretched out. I mean, just, just mentally that's, that, that's, that's pretty crushing at this point in his career, especially with what he went through last year. Yeah, I think that would be a, a tough pill to swallow for Zach Thompson. I also look at it and go, well, especially after he performed yesterday and the stuff looked good. He was locating well relative to his velocity, though. He's still throwing 90-91, and that's something that they've said, you know, mechanically he's kind of trying to sync things up, and it's not where he wants to be, and it's not something that will happen overnight. So the fact that he was able to work with what he had velocity-wise and be as effective as he was – I get like what the structure of it is, is like, well, you need somebody to still be stretched out in case there's another pitching injury. And you'd like Thompson to probably be that guy, because I think he's done enough to where you feel at least semi comfortable with him slotting in. If needed, it's a hard thing to manage the bullpen with basically one fewer guy, because you want to kind of save Thompson for the spots where he's able to go a little bit longer. And you don't know as a manager, when those spots are going to come up throughout a given week or a given series. So I don't envy the Cardinals position on what they're supposed to do with Thompson. I do agree though. If they send him down, it's going to suck. First of all, because nobody wants to be in triple a instead of the big leagues, especially when they're coming off a game where they did perform in the role that they were assigned. And then the other angle of this is down there, they've got that automatic balls and strikes and it's a little bit different strike zone. And that was something that affected guys that the Cardinals, you know, whether it was Dakota Hudson or different guys from last year, they all had like a five and a half ERA in Memphis and then they'd come up and they'd be okay. But it was, it was like a weird kind of transition for those guys because there's almost you have to you have to pitch with like a different set of circumstances in the minors. You don't want to be there. And then you get up to the big leagues and you're trying to adapt to that strike zone. It's almost like from a development perspective, it's tougher for pitchers now with almost like different rule sets between the minors and the big leagues. And I know that that's something that that Zach Thompson would not want is the headache. But if you're the Cardinals, what do you do? Because you need that parachute 
in case somebody gets injured in your rotation in the near future? So I think I think bullpen wise, pr- pretty early here. I mean, man, like JoJo Romero the other day, obviously with the big strikeout and going multiple innings, and you know Helsley off to a nice start, Geo off to a nice start, as we mentioned, Kitridge, uh, Matthew Libitor is is getting there. Um, so I think bullpen overall pretty dang solid. I think you and I both thought they have the potential to have a really good bullpen, and then starting staff wise, you know. Miles Michaelis and Kyle Gibson are the two guys to me that uh, there's just like early on here. I don't expect Matt's to always be this good, but when he's healthy, Steven Matt's is, is pretty good. Sonny Gray should be close to Sonny Gray. Lance Lynn. Okay. I think we all agree. There's going to be a game where Lance Lynn gives up three, four home runs. It's going to happen. But right now he's pitching really, really well. And he's run into all the weather and all the delays and all that too. But, uh, it, you know, with me, it always gets back to that in my brain. Kyle Gibson, to me, always is the guy that allowed four straight homers. I'm telling you. And Awful, it's just, Charlie. I think, but I think Kyle Gibson and Miles Michaelis, there is so much volatility to their starts, you know, and they both may end up with a four or five ERA. I don't know, but it's going to be the Kyle Gibson, I think, where seven innings really good. Then he gives up whatever it was, the six runs. I I do think Kyle Gibson, from a stuff standpoint, there are going to be outings like that. Miles Michaelis is is kind of the same way. When you don't strike people out and you allow a lot of balls in play, you know, we're probably going to be hearing about soft contact because, look, there's going to be balls in play. All of a sudden, you give up a double in the gap. You give up a three-run homer. You have a really bad-looking line. I mean, Miles Michaelis doesn't have a lot of room for error. Kyle Gibson, I think we're going to ride the roller coaster so I don't know. I think I think overall, though, still, I would say the rotation's a little better than I thought. And I, I never thought the rotation was going to be good. I was hoping it wasn't going to be in the 20s. I mean, if it's middle of the pack with a good bullpen and a good offense, I think they're OK. The offense sucks right now. But what do you think about the rotation? Because to me, it's like I said, slightly better than what I expected. Uh, you've gotten everything you could have hoped out of the rotation, in my opinion. You had Miles get beat up by the Dodgers in the first game. Terrible matchup for him, in my opinion, with the lefties that can slug in that lineup, and he pitches to contact. Their contact tends to travel. So I I just didn't think it would be a great matchup for him. In the two games that he's pitched since, he's had a quality start. Six innings, two runs. Six and two-thirds, two runs. I know his ERA is 4.7. That's because of the first game. I like what you've gotten from Michael. Steven Matz, they've managed him really well, I think. It's okay. If you're only getting five or five and a thirds out of mats, if it's a good five, then you take that. Lynn has pitched well despite the different circumstances of the, it seems like it's pouring down rain every time he has to pitch. So I think all things considered, I'm pretty cool with the the performance you've gotten from him so far. And, And Gibson had the one really good game. And then I do think it matters that he had in his second game that was so bad, he still threw you six innings. I know people are tired of hearing about that, but I'm telling you it was part of what the Cardinals envisioned for their offseason when they said, we just need to be able to save our bullpen. And it absolutely came into uh, into play in the Philly series this week. You didn't win the games because of your offense. But if you look at the fact that they didn't have to use anybody prominent on Sunday because Gibson, Gibby, my guy, went six instead of going two and two-thirds and giving up seven runs, he went six. The fact that you had basically your full complement on Monday, game that you lose in extra innings, but to me, the offense is to blame for that a little bit because you only scored three runs. That game probably didn't have to go to extra innings if you can win it four to three. So the relievers pitched pretty well. Helsley gave up a, a chopper down the line by by Alec Bohm that it's just it happens sometimes. And when they start a guy on second base automatically, you lose. I didn't have any problem with Ryan Helsley. And then he was lights out the next time he came out to pitch. You get the win on Tuesday. The bullpen is lights out. Wednesday, Palante is the one guy that gives something up. But again, with the circumstances of Sonny Gray at 65 pitches, And day game after a night game, you were a little bit limited as it was in this series from a bullpen perspective. It would have been so much worse if Kyle Gibson doesn't do what he does on Sunday. So I know people don't like to hear about how it matters that a guy is still able to get you six and eat innings. I think it matters, and it would have mattered even more. We'd be singing the praises even more of Kyle Gibson if if not for the offense having such a rough series against Philly. Because if they score four or five runs a game instead of three, Cardinals end up probably winning two or three or even sweeping that series. And we go, it's a damn good thing that Kyle Gibson was able to save the bullpen like he did. Because they didn't really reap the full benefits of it, people probably don't care. 
But I'm telling you, that's what the Cardinals envisioned. He did what they envisioned. And so for me, one through five in the rotation, I, I don't think you could ask for much more than they've given you so far. And if it's sustainable, offense comes around, this is going to be a good team. But is it sustainable? In the same way that we say the offense won't be as bad through 13 games, what's the rotation? Is this going to be something they can keep up the whole way? Right. And and we're not going to be results oriented here on this podcast. I don't think either of us are. Not but this one. I, we'll do it on I another get it. Podcast. There you go. But I understand how it plays on social media. And I like to I like to kind of jump in and just just watch the show because you do know you do know what's going to happen. And and this gets back to to reasonable people. Both things can be true at the same time, which is Kyle Gibson was horrible in the first inning on Sunday. He cost them that game, but it was helpful for him to go six innings and going six innings did set up the Cardinals really well from a usage standpoint to have success in the Philly series. But as you mentioned, it was more of an offensive issue. And this to me gets back to last year, which was, and I know we always bring up Wayno, but it wasn't just Wayno. It was, whether it was, uh, I mean, who the Woodfords of the world or Dakota Hudson, the Cardinals were having starts last year that were so bad, they didn't just lose on Sunday. It caused a loss on a Monday and a Tuesday because they were going three and a third, three and two thirds, bullpen tax. You can't use this guy the next day. So at minimum, I agree, Kyle Gibson going six, you didn't lose any games beyond Sunday. Yes, you lost Sunday because of Kyle Gibson, but he still set you up for success. It's not his fault that the offense sucked over the next three days against the fighting Phils. Yeah, and, and last year, like, it, it was also some guys that are still in the rotation. Like, Stephen Matz had a handful of four-inning outings when he was pitching so poorly at the beginning of the season, and some of that happened where they lost on subsequent days because of, of a guy like Matz. Now, did they change anything because of that? No, they said, hey, Matt's is still going to be in the rotation. They just were banking on a better version of Matt's. And so far through two games, small sample, they're getting it. But yeah, that's that's why the Cardinals went the way that they went in the offseason. They signed these veterans that they thought these guys are just going to go six and they're going to eat these innings and we're not going to end up with the bullpen. Like I, you can look at your top five relievers in the bullpen. And if you would say that's an A reliever, that's an A reliever, that's an A minus reliever, that's a B plus reliever. Those guys ended up performing all kind of like C to C plus relievers because of the the amount that they were asked to fill. The Cardinals are saying, look, our rotation might just be a C or a C plus, but if we've got A relievers out there, they're going to have the opportunity to perform like A relievers because they're not going to be used as often as they they were last year or in the circumstances that they were where it said, hey, you're not really a multi-inning guy, but you got to throw two today because we simply need you to. And if that doesn't work, we're going to lose this game too. Like it. It sets up better if the rotation continues to give them the the sort of length that we've seen through a couple of weeks. Um, early on here, Cardinals in last place, but it's look thirteen games in. They're six and seven. Can't Anything catch the Pirates. The Central. That's the thing. The Pirates. Are we really believing the nine and three Pirates? The, those scrappy Brewers. They always find a way to be competitive. Yeah. Eight and three. Cubs seven and five. Reds six and six. You you can make the argument that kind of I think what a lot of people expected to happen in the central you could almost flip the standings now maybe maybe reds cubs not exactly but they're so close right now but uh the pirates have had good starts before last season i don't know if they have staying power but i don't know also it's it's really for me it's way too early like you have to go through the turn through the rotation to me like four or five six times before i even really start to to even begin to make any type of conclusions yeah, I don't think right now looking at the division and saying, oh, the Cardinals are cooked because they're in last. I mean, it's just it's been a couple of weeks to this point. But I mean, to the to the credit of the Pirates, they're getting offensive contributions from from guys that we know are good, like Brian Reynolds and, and O'Neill Cruz. But they're also they're getting the pitching and they haven't even called up Paul Skeens yet. That's the thing. Like when they call up Paul Skeens, who's been lighting up triple A, there is a world in which maybe their pitching sustains itself, too. Like I think the I think the Pirates can finish at or above 500 this year. I don't know about a nine and three pace that they're on right now, but I you look at last year. I think they won like 76 games. We always mentally sort of catalog the Pirates as just being terrible, dreadful, 100 loss. They weren't that last year. They finished better than the Cardinals by a handful of games. They've got young players that maybe are another year into their careers, so perhaps they continued to perform. I think 
you're going to have to overcome at least a, you know, 81, 82 win pirates team, unless the bottom totally drops out of it. Um, other teams in the division, the Brewers might not be terrible. Like they, they did trade burns. And so everybody kind of looked at it and said, Oh, they're selling. I think that was a unique circumstance because they knew they couldn't resign him, but they still signed Reese Hoskins. They still went out and made other moves to try and be in the mix. They kind of did what everybody accuses the Cardinals of doing for the most part, which is ah, just do enough to kind of be in the mix at the end and see they could finish 500. And I think the Cubs and Reds could too. I don't know if there's a truly bad team in this division, but are there any great ones? The Cardinals might kind of luck out with the fact that there might not be any great ones. If the Cardinals could be that team if the offense could get going, because I think what you've seen from the pitching is enough to get them there if you have a top 10 offense. But like you said, 23rd in OPS, that's where they are. Is it where they're going to be? Maybe not. But if it is, if that's where they stay, it's not going to cut it. So I think we can all be honest about that. One of my favorite parts about Cardinal fandom is uh, the angst slash celebration when you see <laughs> players leave the organization and then do really well. And we'll get to Tyler O'Neill. I already I did a little bit of my take on on him yesterday, and I want to talk to that, uh, talk to you about that as well. But I think I think because the outfielder thing, we've done that now for five years. That's and old it's, it's part <laughs> right, it's part of a big bucket of outfielders that we'll we'll discuss. But the Jordan Hicks thing, I think, is really interesting too. So yes. if folks don't know, so in three starts, he's two and oh. 18 innings, only 13 strikeouts, but not walking, folks. His whip is 0.8. And uh, this just kind of gets back to the development, the development of pitching. Now, we know that Jordan Hicks was a big-time reliever when healthy, throwing 105, 106, really, really good reliever. But the, the, the fact that this guy could be a really good starter, and I think we both know that the value – of a really good starter is so much greater, especially if he's your own guy, you don't have to pay him for a while. Now that's not the same situation, but it's just the fact that why early on is he having this success with the giants as a starter? Remember the Cardinals gave him a little bit of a shot as kind of a quasi opener a couple years ago. But uh, you know, we've talked about this with Helsley, you know, could Helsley have been a good starter? Trevor Rosenthal always said he wished he could have been a starter. Who knows if Rosie could have been a good starter? We'll never really know the answer to that, but I think it's fascinating when you see a guy that the Cardinals early on said, you're a reliever, now freaking six, seven years later, becoming a damn good starter. Yeah, and I think you have to look organizationally at the way that they've approached it. There, It's always been, hey, you can have a guy come up as a reliever, and then it doesn't exclude him from being a starter down the road. But the caveat to that is it does exclude you in the Cardinals world if you throw 100. Because they're never gonna, they're never gonna put you back. They're gonna be too. They're gonna. They haven't been able to necessarily find the relievers to say we don't need this guy who can throw a hundred to be in our bullpen right now. We can afford to. We have the luxury to leave him in Memphis. We can have him develop as a starter. We can wait. They haven't really taken that approach. It's always been ah, get him up here because otherwise, who's throwing the eighth? Who's throwing the ninth? And those guys end up doing really well at that because well, they throw a hundred. But it is kind of one of those things that I think they just have taken for granted because of how good historically their defense has been. I think it's always been eh, pitch to contact in the starters. Not so bad. We need guys who throw strikes. Those are the guys who are starters because if you don't throw strikes, you, you can't get deeper into games. You can't throw six innings, throw strikes, let your defense back you up. And then we'll have when the game's on the line in the eighth and ninth, those guys who throw a hundred can come out and be your closers. I think that pretty much sums up the way the Cardinals have done it historically. And you can even look at the way they've drafted in somewhat recent years. Michael McGreevy is a guy that they picked in the first round. Why? Because he had great command through strikes. But does he have the upside to get into a rotation at the big league level and be a number two or be an ace? I don't think many people have have him pegged for that. And that is that's a that's a development thing, but it's also a drafting thing. Like, are they willing to go after the just the raw prospects that can turn into stars? Tink Hens is a guy that I think people hope can turn into that. That was a unique circumstance, though, when they picked him in 2020 because they took a bunch of high school guys because college seasons didn't happen. And, th and they said, we might as well zig where we would usually zag because we don't really know a lot about these college players anyway. Let's draft a Jordan Walker. Let's draft a Mason Wynn and a Tink Henson. Let's go for upside. And what do you know? Like, even though Walker's kind of struggling right now, I think everybody looks at that draft as being the one you can hang your hat on in recent years for the Cardinals. So it is a deep conversation that we, I think we could take two hours and explain it instead of just a one hour podcast where it's like, 
do the Cardinals need to look at things a little bit differently and maybe not pigeonhole a guy into a bullpen role just because he can objectively thrive in it today? What are you costing the team down the road? Because, man, having that starter throwing on 750000 who could be more than just like a Zach Thompson, maybe he's a number six, maybe he's a number five. Like a lot of these guys have a guy come up and they're great and you're not paying them and that gives you the luxury to then be a little bit aggressive in free agency. When a Jordan Montgomery's price falls and he doesn't take four years to sign, boom, now you can afford that luxury. The Cardinals have perennially been in a spot where they don't feel they can do that because they're just having to backfill for $11 million in free agency. But what's interesting is they could have done this with Hicks if they wanted to, right? He signed the Steven Matz contract, identical, four years, $44 million. And the Giants, I think, are one of the best teams in baseball at getting the most out of pitchers and saying, hey, throw this pitch a little bit more. Take a little bit off this one. Here's what you need to do. The Giants deserve credit for if this is sustainable for, for Jordan Hicks having a one ERA through three starts. The Giants are going to deserve a lot of credit for that. It's always what Jordan wanted to do. But for whatever reason, it's that change of scenery thing, just like with the outfielders. Ah, they needed a change of scenery. They need to. Why is it always from St. Louis? Why is that the scenery that all these guys are getting the change of and the, then they're going out elsewhere and performing? It's it's a little bit of a bummer when you can look internally and go, ah, they don't have that guy that they've been able to to develop as a starter and get that type of performance from. It's you throw your hands up, man. That's all you can do. But I think it is a deep conversation that you could look organizationally and go, why does this keep happening? Why is this something that took at, took place again with a guy who came up as a starter and thrived until you said, yeah, let's make him a reliever. Right. And I think that is what is important to note about Jordan Hicks, that sometimes we forget unless you go back there, you know, sometimes you understand, like look at Zach Thompson, for example, Zach Thompson towards the end, I don't want to say of his minor league career, but he was struggling as a starter to a point where maybe it opens up the conversation, do we turn him into a reliever? Jordan Hicks was different. Jordan Hicks, I'm looking right now, in 2016 and 12 starts in A-ball rookie, 2.97 ERA. The next year, two teams, uh, A and advanced A, 2.74, 19 starts. He was very young. He was a, a, a successful starter in the minors on that trend, but they put him into the bullpen immediately. And he became a reliever, and he never really got that shot again besides the the one year with the weird opener. He also had – look, maybe if you were going to give him another shot, remember he had the COVID, obviously, where he opted out. He had Tommy John. He had some weird stuff. But with what you're saying, I think is very interesting about not just pitchers, more so outfielders. We'll get to Tyler O'Neill. Why is the change of scenery always working when they leave – why are we not getting that positive bump in the change of scenery when people come here and remember, I say we as Cardinal Nation, we had that for years with Dave Duncan. So if you don't think that's possible, that Dave Duncan can take some of these reclamation projects, guys that throw hard four, uh, four seamers, turn them into two seamers, sinker slider, pitch to contact. I mean, for 10, 15 years, we saw the Cardinals use that coaching staff advantage it seems like the Cardinals no longer have that, and other teams do. Um, Hicks, the outfielders, I don't even know what the outfielders, if it's coaching, if it's more as developing, understanding what you have before you you let that person walk, you know? Yeah, I would say, though, like, there are examples where you could say they've had guys come here and then their career does take off. But it's mostly been, the ones that come to mind for me anyway, a very specific type of trade that gets made. It's a guy that's extra on your bench that you trade for sort of a middling reliever that's not totally proven or that's not, you know, an obvious closer. And then he comes, Giovanni Gallegos is an example of that. They traded Edmundo Sosa to get JoJo, and JoJo has now established himself as a guy that you can rely upon in late innings in St. Louis. And and so, like, those are the the examples where I would say, like, Credit to the Cardinals for identifying and making those types of trades. You trade Luke Voigt, you get back a guy who's a staple in your bullpen for five years. Kittredge for Palacios is another one that it's very, very early, but I think we both are looking at that deal going, yeah, that's that's pretty good the way the Cardinals were able to get another reliable arm into their bullpen. But yeah, they haven't really necessarily done that too frequently. It's because I think with position player trades, they 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 try to squeeze out every last bit of value. And if a guy has trade value in a moment, they are they're 
whether it's gun shy or just unwillingness because, well, why would we trade a guy who's playing well? There's never that type. Like, I don't think anybody could find me that kind of trade where you've had a guy who's a starter or a regular on the team and the Cardinals make the bold decision to trade them at the height of their value to make a, to make a bet almost that, Hey, this guy's a good player, but w- this is probably the height of the value that we're going to have for him. Even when you make a good trade of Bader for Jordan Montgomery, Bader was not at the height of his value, right? He, he had been injured. They had a chance once upon a time to do that deal for Zach Wheeler, right? Like Bader was one of the outfielders that maybe when he was, what was it with the, with the Mets or whoever it was back in the day, that that was a deal that maybe was on the table could have been made. The Cardinals go, eh, you know, we're, we're, we don't want to trade Bader. We think he's our future. He's our present and our future. You can make the case with Dylan Carlson that when he had a height of his value, the Cardinals said, well, no, if he does that for the next decade, we want that guy extended and here and playing daily. But they haven't been able to ever make that trade that's a little bit bold or you extract the most value that you can. This offseason that just happened, people may be advocated for Nolan Gorman to be a guy they do that with. Is it risky? Hell yeah, a guy could hit 40 homers. But like you said, is he ever going to put it together, be average, uh, batting average guy who also slugs and gets on base and does everything? Like the Cardinals haven't made those types of deals. So when you talk about change of scenery, it seems like they're usually, Tyler O'Neill, great example, trading the guy after they've tried it and tried it and tried it, and for whatever reason it wasn't working here, rather than, hey, you know what? This guy has a skill set that we might be able to acquire something we need for, and maybe privately, we just don't know if this guy is cut out for it. We think we might be in the optimal moment to sell on this player. That's never been a move that Mosellock's front office, I think, has been willing to do. And I'm not, it's hard to say that as a criticism because we can't tell the future out here. We're wrong all the time about guys and say, oh, you got to get him off this team. And then Lane Thomas turns into a competent major league outfielder for a number of years in Washington. So we as the public don't always know, but I always kind of like to say, yeah, but it's their job to know. Like over time, Mm -hmm. you're going to be graded and judged on how often you execute those types of deals and get the most for your talent. So it's a, it's a mild criticism. I don't want to go overboard and say, yeah, the front office stinks. They've had some good success. But in that area in particular, it's interesting that it's always kind of one year late that they seem to be unloading these guys. And O'Neill, they were done with him. They said, we're going to get what we can for him. And everybody knew he'd go to Boston, and if he's healthy, he'd be good. So here here we are. Yeah, I think, to me, it's just the trend. The trend line is low. I don't remember anything, John Mozeliak, having any mistakes like this his first 11 years. The last five or so, there's been a lot of them. And like you said, give credit for the JoJo's. For the Geos, you know, he's been very savvy, usually in the Asian market. If you go back to Michaelis, whether it was Michaelis, you know, Soon Wan Oh, KK, obviously, uh, you know, our guy, uh, what was his name? Drew, uh, Drew Verhagen. Verhagen. Drew didn't Ver. work they, out. They tried, you know, it was a right. little risk signing. But again, savvy moves in the Asian market, savvy to pick up some of those nice, solid relievers that you mentioned. But it's just different when it's, I mean, all-star, Cy Young, MVP-type guys that, for whatever reason, I don't even want to get into why every single one of these people left, but it is Sandy Alcantara, Zach Galen, guys, Cy Young caliber. We'll see what happens with Jordan Hicks. But Randy Rosarena, Adolis Garcia, all-star, MVP vote caliber. We know Tyler O'Neill is MVP vote caliber my thing with Tyler O'Neill is look doesn't surprise me but it won't surprise me if he gets hurt it won't surprise me if he doesn't have a great year next year my thing with Tyler is different because no matter what anybody wants to say okay did Ali not lose the clubhouse last year sure I'll agree with that he for sure lost Tyler O'Neill I'll tell you that and Tyler O'Neill admitted that on foul territory it became relationship he called it respect at arm's length so you know, Ali, if you had to call him out, you had to call it his manhood, you had to call out his effort, right? You lost the player to a point where you had to trade him. I understand trading him, but you traded a dude in a walk year that you know has the potential in any given year to be an MVP caliber player, and you got a reliever that's not on your big league roster for him. And I think that's a big part of this. At the end of Tyler O'Neill you essentially had to to break up the relationship because of the way he was treated. And let's be real. You didn't get very much for him. Now, if Nick Robertson becomes Jojo or Gio in the next couple of years, I'll change my mind on that. But right now you got one guy. I mean, Tyler O'Neill leads the league in everything right now, literally 
on base 489, slug 857, OPS 1346, OPS plus 282, six bombs, 13 runs. I don't think it's going to continue. I think the Tyler one is very complex, but I do think the way Ali handled the base running thing last year ruined that relationship for the future. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that played a part in it. I also think, though, for the Cardinals, it's like, you said, well, why does it keep happening that the outfielders, like, they keep choosing the wrong ones, basically. Mm -hmm. They keep backing yes. the wrong horse. And it's it's uncanny that it keeps happening the way that it's happened. But I think the change of scenery factor is one that maybe there's always going to be a benefit to that guy who goes elsewhere with a chip on his shoulder because he didn't get the playing time or didn't, even if it wasn't a case of adversarial relationship with management, maybe just just didn't get the playing time. Like, Adolis Garcia never really got a shot. Rosarina never really got a full scale shot for more than a, you know, a few games at a time. And so that can propel a player perhaps to say, Oh, I'll show them. Like, I don't know. I haven't asked those guys that, but is that maybe in the back of their mind at some point in the early goings of their career? I wouldn't doubt it for a second. So like that contributes to it as well, but it's just like, if you've got five outfielders in a given, you know, a given spring or a given season where you say, Hey, next year, we got to trim this to four. They continue to say, well, you know, they wanted Libertor. They they thought, hey, we've done this thing at developing starters where we kind of sort of stink at it. So maybe this guy who was a first round pick, we can get him. He's a lefty. He's lanky. He, he throws hard. Like, this is what we need. And right now, if we're going to say we've got five outfielders, a Rosarena might be the third best one. And we might even think that internally, but they're making a trade with us like he's our best player. So we need to go ahead and do this deal because we're going to get something that we don't have for something that we feel like we've got plenty of. And it's just uncanny that they keep then the guys that are in their outfield keep kind of underperforming by 10% or 8%. And then the guy that they thought was maybe there, even if they thought internally that he was better than Bader or better than who, you know, at the time Carlson or whoever it was, they say, well, they're asking, they, this is the guy that can get this deal done and we need a Libertor. And then the guy that's the Libertor doesn't end up filling the role. It's not that everybody just stinks that they, that they acquire. It's like they're a little bit underwhelming. And the guy that they they could have kept and put their arms around and said, you're our dude, let's go see it. They said it to somebody else who was, maybe he performed like right around league average like a Dylan Carlson, but he's not great. And a, a Rosarena is, and Adalis is, and these other guys are great when they get those opportunities elsewhere. So I know Moselak is tired of hearing about it. He made the joke in December when he was asked at the winter meetings, like, yeah, you got a little bit of a surplus on the outfield. You're looking to trade one of these guys. You know what? You've had a Rosarain has happened to you. You've had a Dallas Garcia has happened to you. How does are you a little bit worried about that notion? He said, "Yeah, whoever we trade is probably going to get MVP votes." That was the direct quote. Like it's a self fulfilling prophecy at this point, and the Cardinals can't get away from it. It is it's uncanny, but it's 2024, and we're still talking about it with one of these outcast outfielders. Yeah, and a Dallas Garcia to me, different late bloomer. Everybody had a shot at him. Randy Rosarena is the main one because you never gave him an opportunity. And look, the Rays don't make a lot of mistakes. So I'd also right. be thinking, well, wait, why did the Rays want this guy so bad that we've never given a shot in the big leagues, but he's been great in the minors. And why are the Rays so ready to punt on Libertor a couple years in a first round pick? Like, let's think yeah. about that too. They usually don't make mistakes uh, on, on the level we've seen the Cardinals make the last several years. I think with Tyler O'Neill, what bugs me about that, and and I think this plays a lot into it in organizations. If a player is drafted, if there's people in that room that are still in the organization that drafted that guy, they always see the best in him. They don't want to move those guys because it's a bad look when your big time draft pick doesn't pan out. And that's probably why somebody like Dylan Carlson is always going to get 5,000 opportunities. Right. Because, oh, he's their guy. He was the number one pick. There's people in the organization. They all vouch for him. You know, Tyler O'Neill came in a trade. It's different. Tyler O'Neill. He had the great year. He was always hurt. He had the thing with Ollie. My thing is with Tyler, though, we saw it. You know, we saw an eighth in the MVP season. We have never seen anything like that from Dylan Carlson. And he gets 5000 opportunities. Yeah, but I would say this, like, they came into last year not doing it that way. Tyler is the guy that got opportunities to begin last year. They even said you're going to be the center fielder. Now, it went so horrifically bad within a week that you look back and he only played center field like 10 times in the season. Like, it wasn't 
it, it didn't end the year that way. But Dylan was kind of the guy that on paper was boxed out coming into the year because the Cardinals said, look, this guy, Tyler is coming on. You know, he's a couple of years from being able to walk. We know what the raw material says. We could use a guy that can lock down and stabilize center field while hitting the way that he can, because then you can play a, you know, a, an upcoming Lars Newpar in the corner, or you can play some of these other guys like Burleson and, and, you know, maybe they thought ahead to Jordan Walker. That guy can play in the corner and we've got a center fielder that's just doing it all. We got a star out there. So they, they tried to make Tyler O'Neill happen in St. Louis, at least initially. But like you said, sometimes behind the scenes, there might be some friction where, hey, we spent a first round pick on this other guy. Are we really going to? And, and then all he sees what he perceives as a lack of hustle in the first you know week of the season. And he goes, this is ridiculous. I'm really having to play this guy. And this is what he's given me. Like, I'm not saying that's exactly what happened, but you can sort of see how that that would be framed for a manager when internally, organizationally, they might be looking at other guys going, this is really what I'd rather do, but we kind of feel like we're tied to this other thing. So that that's maybe where some of that friction can develop too. It is a really interesting conversation. It's kind of beating a dead horse at the same time, but when the horse keeps being revived every summer, it's like we still have to keep talking about it because it's a it's the same story, but with a new player each and every time it happens. And the crazy one, I'm not predicting this, but if this were to happen with Dylan Carlson too, oh, dude. in a year or two, I, need like it. My I, thing, I crave it. Right. <laughs> no, it's it's great. For I like business. Dylan Carlson. I want him to do, no, do well. So do I. I just think with Tyler O'Neill, it's the Cardinals' fault in the relationship that it got to this point. It's Tyler's fault in always being hurt, and it is Tyler's fault. He, he should have hustled. But with one year left, in his walk year, it got to a point that you needed a change of scenery so bad that you had to move him and every other team knew you were leveraged and you didn't get anything, relatively speaking, for him. I think if you'd have traded him for an Andrew Kittredge, yeah. people would have understood. But it got to a point where the value was essentially gone. And I think that's what people have now seen with Dylan Carlson. You did the same thing now with Dylan Carlson probably. And the difference between Tyler and Carlson is like you said, even though Carlson had a 780 OPS one year, which is pretty good, that's like the Newt Bar. Like if if Newt Bar continues to have 780, 800 OPS, you're like, well, Lars Newt Bar is great. But then you go, well, that's still not an 850 OPS. Like what is Lars Newt Bar? And is he ever going to stay healthy? Like that, you don't ever want that to be the next conversation. But two years ago, or, or even like last year, you go, well, Lars Newt Bar, obviously he's the, the present and the future. I mean, he's a superstar. But like until you see those numbers and those are the guys that you're, you're putting your weight behind to be able to play every day. Those guys have to turn into great and not, you know, 109 OPS plus, which is pretty good. Whatever Newt's was 114, like that's pretty good. But yeah, you're, you're kind of ultimately there's only three spots in that outfield. And then you, you deal with the DH two, you've got to figure out a way to, to prioritize the right guys. And they continue to kind of not make that happen. And with O'Neill almost out of spite, like it's easy to say now because he's looking great. And I knew they were trading him. Like, I knew they wouldn't get to camp and he would be on that team. It wasn't tenable. He but said that. Moselock. He did. And so when the Mo, when Mo says it publicly, you know it's not. I mean, it was just automatic. He was going to be dealt for anything they could get. And Nick Robertson in a, in a minor league pitcher that we won't see for a while ends up being the answer to that. Almost out of spite, you could said, screw it. We're not letting this happen again, even though this situation is is not tenable. It's like, Tyler... You're sticking here and and you'll either play or you won't or whatever will happen. But we will not let this happen again when they knew they were almost trading him as like a kind of like a pseudo salary dump because they weren't going to get a difference maker necessarily for him at that point because of where the value had gotten. I think there are some Cardinals fans who would go out of spite. They should have just said like not spite toward Tyler, but spite toward their past mistakes. It's like we we physically will not allow this to happen again with this guy. And it was like a situation tailor made for it to happen when you look at the raw materials that O'Neill is dealing with. So uh, I don't know. I don't know what the answer would have been. Clubhouse stuff matters too. And if it wasn't tenable in the clubhouse, then it wasn't tenable in the clubhouse. But like you said, is that really all on Tyler that that wasn't the case? Like these are fair topics in my opinion. All right. Well said, Brendan. We're at about an hour here. I'm not going to lie. I have to pee. So <laughs> hey, that's fair. Hey, we're going to end it. But hey, it was the right time to end it anyway. So, Brendan, be Schaefer daily. The right time Brendan. to end this relationship with this podcast. Was there maybe more in the tank? Yeah, possibly. But it was the right time to end it. You had to end it somewhere. That was Hold like on, a though. reference to Tyler O'Neill and the Cardinals. Anyway, I went for it. It's okay. If it but didn't look, land, that's all right. Look my notes? Yeah. We hit on everything. 
Oh, we did it then. I had nothing else. You had notes? Man. Well, as I go, as I go, yeah. you know? Okay. All right. This is well, good. Follow, follow Be Shafe Daily and uh, follow and comment, like, subscribe this channel. Share the videos. Put them on social media. Put them in your group text with your Cardinals fans and friends. And let's grow this bad boy, Brendan. All right. Good job, buddy. I say let's grow it. Yeah, baby. All right.